Welcome everyone to our webinar, Reduce the Risk of, the risk of Falls on Ice by a Factor of Three with a New Generation of Winter Footwear, Preventing Falls While Encouraging Outdoor Activity, facilitated by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Mariel Ang, and I am the Project Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. ONF supports the Fall Prevention Community of Practice and its online platform called Loop. Loop is a place where fall prevention practitioners connect. Visit us at www.fallsloop.com. This month also marks our annual Fall Prevention Month campaign. Although we, want, we, we run webinars throughout the year, we are delighted that this webinar will be kicking off a series of three webinars on various fall prevention topics this November. I will be sharing information on the next two webinars we will be hosting this month at the end of the presentation. For more activities, please visit www.fallpreventionmonth.ca. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the Level 3 meeting system. This webinar technology consists of two parts. The audio is provided through a telephone conference line, and the visuals are provided through a web platform. The phone number for the conference line and the link to the web platform were sent to you by email after you registered for the webinar through Level 3. If you have questions about the technology at any time during this presentation, please type them into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can send me an email at mariel.ang at onf.org. I'll work with you to resolve technical issues as soon as possible. This webinar will contain opportunities for participation. There will also be a video conferencing option. You should be able to see TELAC live in a separate window, and you can minimize this window at any time. There will also be online polls throughout the presentation, which you will answer directly on your screen, and there will be a question and answer period at the end. If you have topic-related questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. During the Q&A, questions will be read aloud to the group. If you would prefer to ask your question over the phone, we will provide the instructions to unmute your line during the Q&A. The webinar is being recorded, and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week along with the presentation slides. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Tilak Dutta. Tilak is interested in coming up with new ways of attacking seemingly, seemingly interactable problems such as falls in the winter, back injuries for healthcare workers, and pressure injuries for people with mobility limitations. He is a scientist at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute and holds an assistant professor appointment at the University of Toronto in the Institute for Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. And without further ado, please take it away, Tilak. Thank you for that great introduction, Marielle, and thanks for inviting me here today. Um, I see we have nearly 80 people on the line. That's, that's fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us, taking time. Um, out of your day to join us. I'll try to make it worth your while here in this presentation. Um, I want to start out with a quick question for you. Uh, if you can, so you should see a poll come up on your screen there. I want to know if you have slipped on ice. And yes or no, and if yes, it was a no injury, was it a minor injury, was it a serious injury? Um, it'd be, um, go ahead and fill that in. And I want to, and I'll start telling you about a little story about a woman named Joy. I'll show you her picture in just a minute once a few more people have had a chance to fill in the poll. Um, Joy um, was leaving work one day, uh, almost four years ago, almost exactly four years ago. She was walking out of the building with a colleague, someone who works here at Toronto Rehab Institute, and she slipped and fell and hit her head. And right away she knew that it was a bad fall. Um, she felt like she needed to throw up. And so she knew that there was, uh, that it was a serious injury, um, and so she went to the emergency room, they checked her out, uh, they did a scan, they said there was no bleeding in her head, um, so they sent her home. But over the next few days, she started noticing she was acting a bit strange. She would um, only half empty the dishwasher, she would only half empty, uh, half make her bed, um, she would uh, feel confused a lot, she would cry a lot, she wasn't able to do her work anymore. And that, um, those symptoms lasted uh, over a good part of a year. She said even a year later she still didn't feel back to normal. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll continue the story in just a second. So it looks like we've got, uh, everyone can see the results of that 
poll, hopefully. So I'd say the vast majority of the of the viewers here have experienced an injury, and most of those are without. Uh, sorry, have have experienced a fall, uh, but most of them are without any injury. So that's a good uh, a good sign. Uh, yet we see uh, minor injuries and serious injuries making up maybe 40% of those on the line right now. So that's a pretty that's a pretty big number. So. Um, so this is Joy, the person that, whose story I was telling you about. And what's interesting about her story is that she was actually really well prepared for this, uh, for the day. She knew, she would checked the weather, she knew that it was going to be snowing or um, icy conditions that day. So she actually wore her winter boots and winter coat and everything. And she was pretty well prepared. And yet she would tell you that that um, the reason for the fall was that she should have been paying more attention, and she blames herself. And I'd like to argue today that that maybe that's not true. Maybe it's that her footwear let her down. And with better footwear, we might have very well been able to prevent this fall and, and the associated injury. So if you don't have time to stick with us for the whole talk, I'll give you the punchline right now. Basically, it's that there's a new generation of footwear right now that works much better than the vast majority of footwear that's out there, and, and we've now shown that we can reduce the risk of falls by a factor of somewhere between three and five. Um, you can go to our website where uh, we have all the results of our testing, ratemytreads.com, and you can find out which footwear works the best. Um, what I'll try to go through for you today is give you some background on this test and tell you about a couple of studies we've done um, based on that test, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have at the end. So on days like this, when it's icy outside, how do you know how well your footwear is going to perform? Um, particularly if you're an older adult, we, you know, here we're the fall prevention month and the fall uh, prevention community of practice. We are particularly interested in um, making sure that older adults don't fall and we can reduce the risk of falls for them. You know, I think it's, it's also just as important that we find ways of promoting safe mobility, keeping people active. We know that older adults and people with disabilities dramatically reduce their activity levels over the winter when there's snow on the ground, when there's ice on the ground, because they recognize that there's a risk of falls and they know how bad the consequences of those falls could be. And so people often stop being active. And we know that the consequences, we don't talk about this as often as we do um, you know, in terms of uh, the risk of a fall being that it can be a you know, we have devastating consequences to a fall, uh, but the consequences of inactivity actually are the same or if, if not greater. You know, being, and for the same reasons, it's because we end up being inactive for periods of time and it has a really negative downward spiral that can take hold. So we want to find, so, you know, giving better footwear to people not only will reduce the risk of falls, but hopefully get people to be active and stay active throughout the winter months. So wouldn't it be great if we had a system like we do for winter tires? If you go to buy winter tires, you, um, there's a symbol you can see on the side of the tire that, dip, that shows you that, that that tire has been designed and tested in a very specific way and it's been shown that it works well for the conditions that it's designed for. Why don't we have the same for boots? So that's the question that our team has been trying to answer over the past three or four years now, and we've developed a test that can do just that. And if you go into some of the retailers we work with, for instance, Marks is one of them. Um, if you go in there, you'll see a tag on many of the footwear that we've tested that shows how well a given pair of footwear will work on ice for you. This is where we do our footwear testing. Uh, I'll show you some videos of the actual process in a second, but it's, it's, um, the footwear testing happens in this lab, we call it winter lab. There's, a, there's an ice floor inside here that participants can walk up and down, we can, and then we can tilt this whole lab to different angles. And the idea is we keep tilting the lab to steeper angles until we start seeing boots start to slip. So the angle at which you first see a slip we call, or the, I guess the, the highest angle at which you don't see a slip is what we call the maximum achievable angle. And that's what, we use that number, that number in degrees. So if a boot is able to get up to a five degree angle before slipping, 
we rate that boot with a 5. It gets a 5 rating. And based on the number it gets, it gets rated. I'll show you in a second. Um, we, we post those ratings on our website. Um, and, and I'll show you that in a second as well. But before we go deeper into what this maximum achievable angle test looks like, I'll get you to guess, use your best judgment. Um, you know, if you were to try to recommend footwear for one of your patients or clients or people you work with, what would you recommend? So in the next slide, I'm going to give you a poll that you can answer, but go ahead and pick A, B, C, or D. Try to remember the number and enter it into the poll. I'll give you another five seconds before I switch over to the poll. Here we go. So go ahead and enter in which uh, boot you think out of those four will perform the best in our test. Okay, we're seeing a lot of B, a few A, one person is picking D. Okay, so I think most people have had a chance now to fill it out. I'll keep going. And you can, you can, uh, so it looks like it's B followed by A followed by C and then D. Okay, we'll try to remember that. So let's move on. Here's what our footwear testing looks like. So we have this lab and, and we actually test on two different, um, two different ice surfaces. We have what we call a dry ice surface and then we have what we call a wet ice surface. This is uh, a participant. The participant here is actually Jeff Fernie, Dr. Jeff Fernie, who uh, is really the uh, person who came up with this whole idea and developed this lab precisely to do this type of testing. And you can see him walking with uh, what we call boot one, which is one of the four boots that you saw on that list. And you can see that on the wet ice surface, he is able to walk up to maybe a two degree incline before he starts slipping. Now we'll switch to a second boot, and you'll see how well that one performs. And we'll call this one boot two for now. And again, it's one of the eight, it's one of the four boots I showed you earlier. And we'll see how well this one does. Again, on a wet ice surface. So you can see we've already outperformed boot one by getting up to a five degree incline. Here's a ten degree incline. Here's a 19 degree incline. So you can see it way outperforms what we thought, what, what boot one was able to achieve, right? Okay, so which one was boot two? Let's see if how your, how your predictions worked out. So in this, this graph shows the results, the maximum achievable angle result for the four boots that I showed you earlier. And you can see the best performing one is boot D. So I think most of you are probably surprised by that result. Well outperforming boot B, which I think most people selected, followed by boot A, which was actually the worst, which was also boot one in the, that was the first video I showed you. And then boot C comes in uh, somewhere in between. So you're probably surprised by that, but the main point that I'm trying to make here is that you can't tell by looking at a boot, at the, at the grip on the boot or the sole of the boot, how well it's going to perform. What matters is the material properties of those of the rubber and the different materials that are mixed into the rubber that actually make it work. And footwear marketing companies have gotten really good at making it look like there's been a lot of science and technology put into the design of this footwear when in fact it's all superficial. I bet most people pick boot B because there's these little pieces of yellow fleck you know, little bits of yellow paint that's have, that have been put on that, that boot, um, where, while it actually is completely um, not an effective uh, feature of that boot. So, so that's the main lesson that we've been learning um, through our testing is that it's really very, very difficult to tell by looking at a boot how well it's going to perform. Um, boot D, for your interest, you probably want to know why this one was able to perform so well when it doesn't even have a, any kind of tread pattern on it. Um, this boot is actually a prototype boot. It's not something that you'd find on the market, uh, but in a moment I'll show you some of the boots that uh, use similar technologies. 
that, that are actually microscopic technologies that you won't be able to see unless you look at it under an electron microscope. And so that's what you see here on the screen. You see some um, electron microscope images of the sole of this boot. And what you see are there are these little um, glass fibers, was what we've identified in this material. They're really microscopic glass fibers that actually stick out like little, uh, little um, grips that, that gri help grip the ice. And that's what makes this boot work so well. And in fact, most of the technologies that really work well and outperform other boots have something like this in incorporated in their design. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So you can go to our website now and find out what how well different boots perform. Everything we test gets posted on this site. The ones that perform better than a seven degree score, that, that, that are able to climb more than a seven degree incline, will get uh, a recommendation from us. So they get a r rating of one snowflake. You can see under the rating column there in the middle, they get a one snowflake rating if their MAA score is over, uh, is greater than, um, Sorry, I'm just going to grab a pointer here, see if I can get the red one. Yeah. So if the MAA score is greater than 10, um, it gets a one snowflake score. If it's greater than, um, if I remember correctly, if it's greater than 11, it gets two snowflakes. And if it's greater than 15, it gets three snowflakes. So far, we've most of the boots that, that pass our test and get a snowflake only get one. Um, there's a couple now that I understand that we have listed as two snowflakes currently. Um, you can, um, so that's where you can go to find out uh, details. You can click on any of these boots and find out how well it did under uh, both what we call this melting ice or wet ice condition or dry ice condition, um, both uphill and downhill. What we do is we take the minimum value of those four, four numbers when we test with four different people. We take the minimum value of all of that and that becomes the MAA score for that boot. Um, why we pick seven degrees as the critical angle is based on uh, some accessibility guidelines that, that define or they recommend that outdoors, if you have curb cuts and things like that, that they shouldn't be any higher, they shouldn't be any higher uh, slope than seven degrees. Um, but what we see commonly is angles that are that far exceed that. Uh, this is a 10.7 degree slope that's just outside our hospital here at Toronto Rehab Institute, where the driveway, uh, you know, if you're turning in off Elm Street coming into our hospital, this is the slope that you you'd go up, and and pedestrians on the sidewalk commonly walk across that. So you can imagine on a day when there's freezing rain or ice, um, it, it's quite a challenge, and because most footwear does not get anywhere near this um, this angle, being able to to stay, um, prevent slipping on, on these angles. And I'll show you that a little bit more. On, yeah, on a day like this, most footwear would fail. Most of the footwear we test scores somewhere in the range of three or four degrees before you start seeing slipping. Um, so I know that the fall c prevention community of practice, the goal is to um, try to prevent falls for older adults. Uh, but we, um, you know, our work, we're trying to leverage, we're trying to find ways of paying for this research uh, that, can, um, that can provide information that will help older adults, but there's not a lot of money necessarily around to do that type of research. And so what we've uh, done is looked at workers. We've looked at people who spend some time outside um, and need footwear to prevent falls for them. Across most industries, actually, falls um, are the, either the number one or the number two most common type of injury out there. Um, and so we looked at personal support workers who have to travel to support older adults um, in their homes when they, if, if they're uh, people that have disabilities or have some sort of illness that, um, that regularly have to travel to these people's homes and provide care. We know that these workers, by the way, uh, get injured. Mo you, know, you might think that back injuries are the biggest cause of injuries or shoulder injuries, which are a big problem because they're involved in bathing and toileting and, and lifting patients and things like that. But in fact, falls in, on outdoor surfaces in the winter, in, depending on the year, are sometimes their most common cause for um, injuries. So 
So because, and it makes sense if you think about it, because these people have to go and visit um, clients who don't always have the ability to keep their walkways clear, keep their steps clear of ice and snow. And so they're actually perhaps some of the people who are at highest risk of falls in the winter. And so we picked a group of personal support workers and we thought we would test footwear also for a complementary group. We thought, what's the group that we could contrast personal support workers with? You know, we have personal support workers who tend to be mostly female. They're pretty vulnerable workers. Most are, are part-time workers. Um, they don't get paid a lot. Uh, and they're responsible for buying their own footwear. Uh, if we contrast that with people who work for the City of Toronto, for instance, paramedics, firefighters, waste collectors, they are mostly male, um, and they get to select footwear from a catalog, and they are subsidized for the cost of most of those, uh, most of those boots. Um, and so we thought we'd see what's available to these two groups. We applied for some money from the Ministry of Labor to do this study. Um, and what we did, in, and we were successful in getting some money for that, so what the study actually did was try to determine what are the most popular types of footwear each of these groups was wearing, or, or would wear. Um, so for personal support workers, we did a survey of 600 personal support workers and identified 35 women's uh, designs and five men's styles. Um, for the city of Toronto, it was easier because we could go to the city and say, what are the types of footwear that you're getting, that you're subsidizing most often? Because there's a list from a catalog that we were able to just look up and say, here are the most common footwear models that, uh, that are being uh, purchased. And so we used that as the basis for our, um, our study. And so we basically tested all of this footwear using our, uh, our our uh, method, our maximum tumult angle method. And so before I show you the results from that test, why don't you go ahead and guess which group you think had the better footwear? Do you think it was the city of Toronto? Do you think it was personal support workers? Or do you, or do you think it's, I'm, it's a trick question and they're both equally bad? So a lot of people are, are um, going with the equally bad. Okay, so it looks like most people think they are equally bad or the city of Toronto had the better footwear. footwear. Okay, good. So we'll go ahead, uh, about 60% believe it's equally bad. Okay, so let's jump forward. Here's what the city of Toronto, here's the results from the 45 pairs we tested of city of Toronto worker footwear. Um, and what you see is, so again, the higher the bar, the better the score, right? The better the footwear scored. What you see is there was only one out of the 45 pairs that achieved a seven degree, uh, a seven degree score. Um, and most of the other ones you can see were, many of them were zero, which is why you don't see a bar there at all, or they're in the two, three, four, five degree range. Most in, I would say, one, two, or three degree range, if you look at that and compare that to personal support workers, you see that there were six boots that we identified that actually got seven or higher on our maximum achievable angle test. And I would say the median score on this um, is also higher. So, so personal support workers, the, the type of footwear they had available to them actually did perform better than what the, the, the stuff that people are getting from the catalog, municipal workers are, are able to order from the catalog. And so when you hear the word safety footwear, slip resistant footwear that are marketed with using those terms, a lot of times that doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, the one, so let's talk a little bit more about the specific footwear that is performing really well. There are there are predominantly two types of footwear that we're seeing mostly uh, make up the majority of the footwear that is uh, that is scoring well in our in our testing. Uh, the first uh, the first type is called Arctic Grip. So this is very similar to that ele that electron microscope image I showed you. There are some sort of microscopic fibers that are embedded within the 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 rubber substrate that um, that grip uh, the ice 
particularly well. And there are a bunch of different manufacturers that have taken that technology. The technology is developed by Vibram, um, but incorporated by a number of different footwear manufacturers and, and retailers. So you can find, if you see Arctic Grip, often you'll see, if I go back a slide, you'll sometimes you'll see this ice, oh sorry, I'll get my pointer back again so you can see where I'm pointing. You'll see this, this ice plus designation here. That denotes, in, in my experience, that's denoted the uh, Arctic Grip technology. The other one um, is actually Green Diamond that you see here as well. So if it says Green Diamond, that means it's the other style of, uh, the other technology that we've found that works really well. And again, they're incorporating, uh, the, their technology is incorporated in a number of different manufacturers' footwear as well. Um, the diamond, the green diamond um, technology is actually, you can actually see it if you do flip it over, you'll see little flecks of um, metal, like little bits of, of, I'm not sure what the metal is, but little flecks of metal that are embedded in the, in the outsole of the shoe. Um, the Arctic Grip, you actually can't see the microscopic features, but they actually add some blue flecks uh, of rubber in the bottom of this, the outsole. That, uh, it, the actual blue flecks of rubber don't do anything, but they kind of can maybe guide you to see that there's something going on there. There's some technology that makes that parts of, those parts of the shoe different, and so that is uh, how you can tell if there's Arctic Grip in the shoe. Um, if I go to the next slide. So the big question then is how well, do, you know, we know that this footwear might work well in our lab environment, but will it actually prevent falls and slips and injuries, right? Would it have prevented uh, slip that the injury that uh, that Joy experienced four years ago. So we did the next phase of our study was to take 100 of these personal support workers um, and split them into two groups. We and give half of them. So 50 of these personal support workers were given some of the best footwear we could find based on our testing, based on their preferences in this survey that we gave them. We selected two pairs. One was a men's men's design, and one was a women's design. Um, the majority of, as I mentioned before, the majority of personal support workers are female. So we had 49 females and one male as part of this study. Uh, so most, mostly what we're talking about is results from this particular Sperry boot that we gave to those workers, um, and they wore them for a period of uh, two months, eight weeks, uh, last winter, so 2018, January, and February. Um, the other 50 um, PSWs were given $150 at the end of the study, uh, kind of to, to say that that was the value of the footwear that they received, um, uh, the, that the other group received, to be fair. Uh, Zara Bagheri was the um, was the postdoctoral fellow that worked on a lot of uh, a lot of the study and made it happen. Uh, so at the end of each week in January and February, we asked them to fill in a short online survey uh, based on and, and it was really just asking four simple questions: Did you walk on any icy surfaces over the past week? Did you slip? If yes, how many times did you slip? Did you fall? If yes, how many times did you fall? And is there anything else you'd like to share? So uh, before I show you the results, I can just tell you that this was meant to be a little pilot study to design th with the goal of designing a bigger study. We didn't actually expect the results from this study to show us significant results. It was more to say, oh, okay, well, if we see this many falls, we should be able to find statistically, statistically significant results if we scale up to 1,000 participants instead of 100. What we found, however, was that people were reporting huge numbers of slips and falls. Like this, this blew us away. This is uh, Jose, who's one of our, um, who is a summer student, uh, actually a, a, an intern who helped with some of this work, um, and he created these graphs. What you see on the left is the number of slips that were reported. So in week one, you can see something like 60-something number of slips reported by the control group versus maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 slips reported by the group that was given foot, the, the better footwear. So comparing the gray and the red bars, you can see how many more slips were reported by the control group than the group that we gave the better footwear. Um, 
Lower numbers of falls were reported. Um, we see it, for instance, in week one, there were seven falls reported no, uh, in, in the control group, no falls reported by the footwear group. Um, we did have one or two in the, in the subsequent weeks report, in the footwear group reporting falls. Um, but overall, you can see far less, if you total up the numbers of falls and slips, you know, for the control group, 400 slips versus 28. Um, sorry, 400 versus 114 slips, and if you look at falls, you see 28 falls for the control group versus five falls reported for the intervention group. Um, it's a bit unfair to look at these numbers directly because we do see lower numbers of responses back from the um, from the control group. Their, their response rate was a little bit lower, um, and so what we need to do is look at the rate of slips and the rate of falls. So here in these graphs, we've now converted those numbers into rates. Um, and the numbers that really matter here are the reduction factor. So how much between the control group and the footwear group can you say the slip numbers were reduced, or the slip rate was reduced? Similarly, how much can we say the fall rate was reduced by giving people better footwear. And so what you see is that we can reduce the slip rate by a factor of three, and we can reduce the fall rate by a factor of nearly five. So these numbers, again, just blew us away. This is, we did not expect to see results that were this big in the, of this magnitude. Um, we'll be rerunning a form of this study over this coming winter again to make sure that these results hold up. Um, but it, it does give us, um, it does demonstrate that there's um, a big, potential big impact. And, and so the company, by the way, before I go on, the company that we were working with on this project, uh, we did a calculation. I'm not, I'm not able to share the numbers exactly, but if, if you were to estimate that the costs associated with the falls that happened, and then calculate how much money would have been saved by providing people better footwear. So this company has 3,000 personal support workers um, in the field. If you were to provide all 3,000 of those workers better footwear, they would have more. They would have saved money, uh, a net savings, six figures to seven figure savings, on top of the cost. That, that includes the cost of paying for the footwear to start with. So there's, there's a real huge potential to save people pain and suffering from falls, but also for companies to, um, to save costs associated with replacement workers and insurance costs and so on. So we're working on that analysis right now to demonstrate kind of the business case to try to motivate more companies to think about doing this because it is such a common problem. Um, so, it's not all good news, though, unfortunately. The bad news uh, with these materials uh, may be that they wear out quickly. And so, they, they, you know, we have to do more work to understand if we're going to recommend this type of footwear, how well is that, you know, that better performance, that better slip resistance going to hold up? Does it stay, you know, how quickly does do these does this footwear wear out? Um, and so what we did is we hired a bunch of our, we, we paid a bunch of our students um, to walk around the block here near our hospital at Toronto Rehab Institute um, uh, a number of times. And, um, and we basically tried to wear these shoes down. So we, we're still in the process of doing this study, but we've completed now a few people who've reached 100,000 steps, which I'm sure many of you who track your steps um, are aware that's not a lot of wear. Um, you know, you can easily walk 10,000 steps a day. So people who walk, um, you know, 100,000 steps is like 10 days of use potentially for some outdoor workers. What you start to see right away is that the scores are dropping. So the the slip resistance is getting worse as you use these boots. So we need more information than this. We need to know how far how far does this keep going down, and what happens if you you know a year later, how well does this footwear work? That's the real question we have to answer. Um, and so we're going to do some work with um, 
this winter with some meter readers. These are people who uh, check natural gas, the amount of natural gas usage, so Union Gas um, hires these people to go home to home and look at the, look at the gauge on your natural gas gauge uh, at your home. Um, and they walk somewhere around 10 kilometers a day in some cases. And so we're going to give some of this footwear to these workers and test to see, repeatedly test to see how the slip resistance wears down over time. Um, and so with the, the other thing that we're doing, you know, we're, we're very worried about these new, uh, these new materials, these new composite materials uh, wearing down. Um, and so uh, Reza, who you see on the left there, and Zara, um, these are both postdocs that have worked with us that have backgrounds in material science. And we've been trying to kind of reverse engineer and engineer our own uh, versions of these materials that we think now we've achieved one, we think that outperforms the existing ones in terms of slip resistance and wear resistance. So it will last longer, we think, um, and provide better slip resistance um, when you're out there. So, so we're, we're hoping to work with a few companies to make some prototypes and actually test them in the real world soon. Um, the goal really here is to come up with a cheaper way to give people slip resistant footwear. I meant, there was one slide above where I didn't actually mention it, but I show the cost that all this footwear that uses these new technologies, um, it really is at a premium price. You're in the range of $150 to $200 retail for those boots. Um, and not everyone's going to be able to afford that. So we're trying to come up with a way to make a slip-on version of those. And there's a company here in Ontario called Impacto that we uh, that have agreed to incorporate our materials in their slip-on uh, slip-ons that we can make um, uh, hopefully at a much lower cost. So that's where we're trying to go. So that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. I have a few remaining thoughts to leave you with before I give you a chance to give some feedback and ask questions. Um, the first point I wanted the, the, to, to get you to think about, I guess, as we think about Fall Prevention Month and what we can, you know, how do we, what, what are we trying to do here? What is the challenge, how big a challenge are we taking on? What is the potential benefit to, uh, to people? You know, if, if we think about what happened in the 1860s with hand washing, right, it took a long time for things like hand washing and in the, in the 1960s automotive safety. Um, you know, Dr. Semmelweis was the guy who was involved with hand washing that first did, figured out that if you wash your hands, you prevent um, new mothers from, from dying on the operating table or from when they're giving birth to children. Um, it, it took a guy named Ralph Nader uh, to institute, to demonstrate that vehicles needed seat belts and other safety features. Um, it took a long time actually to get those those things, um, those what we would call now as very simple ideas and very, um, you know, you no one would argue against seat belts and airbags and things like that now. But people in the 1960s were dead set against them. There were many people who were dead set against these ideas. Um, and han hygiene, similarly, the guy who, Dr. Semmelweis, um, he, I don't think hand hygiene took off until well after he passed away, even though it was clearly uh, a good idea at the time and he was able to show that it was a good idea that was, that was working. Um, in the same way, you know, what is it going to take for better winter footwear to achieve widespread use? We're hoping at Toronto Rehab, we're hoping that, that testing uh, a range of footwear and, and sharing that information with as many people as possible um, will hopefully get people to to understand that it's to their best to their own benefits, huge benefits to purchasing better footwear and, and spending that premium for now until we have uh, lower cost versions out there. Um, but I think there's also another way that we can you know there's still education there's still a big need for education. The people that are looking for this information um, is still a minority of our population. Um, and you know, I think as we think about fall prevention for older adults, um, I think there's a real benefit that we can gain by linking that need for better education with older adults 
to what's happening in the workplaces because there is a big focus, a big, there's a lot of money at stake. These injuries, as I said, cost a lot of money uh, and, and lead to a lot of um, lost time. And as a result of this, it may be that we can leverage and build on that interest by hooking fall prevention month activities into what's happening in the workplace. And so there might be a real positive influence of people that go to work and hear about this in their, um, you know, when, when, uh, when the city workers or personal support workers go out and, and are, are t given better footwear to wear for their work to prevent falls, they will carry that message forward to everyone they know. Their you know, personal support workers will recommend it to their clients and their clients' families and everyone. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done through that through that um, avenue that we should try to take advantage of. Um, okay, so that's really all that I wanted to share with you today, and we can um, we can uh, I'll leave you with a couple of quick questions. The first one is, do you plan to use our website for your next uh, purchase of footwear? Some maybes and mostly yes, that's good to hear. And I, I should tell you that that website is, is constantly being updated as, as companies come to us with, and, and send us footwear to test, we test it, and, and it's constantly being updated. And so, what if you checked it last month? It's very likely that there are new boots that are posted on there now um, that you may have not seen yet. Okay, so we'll stop there. We'll skip to the results here. So most people uh, buy that. That this is a, a good way to go. That's good news. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, I think this is the last question if I remember correctly. Yeah, the last question really is, is there something that I should have talked about um, that I missed that you'd be interested in learning about r related to the type of work that we do? Feel free to submit those comments um, or in, the, in a few minutes we'll, we're going to open it up for questions, so feel free to ask those questions at that time. Um, if you are interested in um, in being part of uh, being on our monthly newsletter, where we release kind of early information um, as it uh, sort of as we get it with footwear, you know, whenever we release a new batch of footwear results, uh, we send out a, a quick note to people to to check our website or other projects that we're working on, um, mostly to do with how we help older adults live independently at home. Um, Oh, what is our website here? I'll send that to you. Yeah, it's so the footwear related stuff is is www.ratemytreads.com. Here, I'll let people keep answering there, but I can I'll type it into the chat box here. It's www.ratemytreads.com is one of them. And we have um, we have another website for our a broader look at the work we do, which is uh, TRI Home and Community. .com. That's also another website that we have. And you're welcome to check. Okay. So I think I will. Hopefully people have had a chance to fill that in. I'm going to move to the next slide. It looks like a couple more people are going there. Okay. I can turn it. Well, why don't I leave it here, Marielle, um, so that people can continue. I'll switch to the last slide where it just has some acknowledgments of the other people that I have to thank um, and the... Um, and the funding that we have for this, but I'll leave it. Oh, sorry, I guess I moved. There we go. Anyways, there's our there's the, some of the people involved with our um, with our study and the partners that that worked with us on on um, on our various studies. You can see our two websites there: ratemytreads.com and tri.homeandcommunity.com. My email address is there. I'm happy to take. Uh, uh, please do email me if you have any questions. And. Um, yeah, I think we can uh, take some questions. Perfect. Thank you very much.
Tillock for such a great presentation. Um, and yes, I'll echo his comments. Uh, I did see some questions going into um, his uh, poll question, um, asking if there was any, any way he could improve his um, presentation. But if you have questions that you would like us to ask right now for this webinar, please feel free to type it into the chat box um, on the bottom left corner of your screen. There have been some um, questions asked already, so I will work through those uh, first. But uh, please continue to um, uh, please continue to type your questions in there, and we will get to them uh, as soon as we can. Um, so I'll start off with a first question uh, by Lin uh, from Linda Strobel. She's kind of got a, a two-part question here. Um, mm -hmm. Does the glass embedded footwear that performs well on ice also perform well in snow? Also, does that footwear then become slippery when worn indoors? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So we, the answer is we don't know. We don't know about the snow one. There's actually, um, this is a very common scenario where you have a layer of ice, let's say you have some freezing rain or ice that forms, and then if you get a light snowfall on top of that, there's virtually no footwear that, is, that we know of yet that will um, prevent a slip under those conditions. So um, that dusting of snow is something that's really tricky. We don't really test on snow in our... We, we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to, to add a snow-related test to the way we do our current testing. So I, don't ha I can't tell you... Uh, I can't give you a straight answer on that, unfortunately. Indoors um, as well, we also have a new method that we're testing out to make sure that footwear that works well outdoors also doesn't cause a fall indoors. Um, and related to that, I can tell you about those uh, that I'm sure you're all familiar with. If you have these um, yak tracks type overshoe things that you stretch over your boots, you know, there is a real danger of those. If you put those on your boots, they're great while you're outside, but as soon as you step inside, if it's a hard floor and it's wet, there's a really big risk of slipping because you have these things packed with snow uh, on an indoor surface. So it is something that we're very aware of and we're trying to figure out the best way to um, test all of our footwear kind of for all of those things. This is kind of what you see on the website now is our first stage, which is ice, um, wet ice, dry ice, which you know I think we assume is the worst case situations that, that are causing falls right now, and so we wanted to get that information out there quickly. Hopefully that answers the question. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and her two-parter was, she just wanted to elaborate, does the footwear that perform well on ice without embedded glass also perform well in snow, and does that footwear perf also perform well on dry floors? Yeah, so so like I, I think I kind of covered that. The We, we don't, so we kind of, um, yeah, I mean, really, we we don't have testing with dry floors and uh, and uh, snow directly yet. Great, thank you, Slack. Um, so another question from Betty Donahue: Have you looked at how well footwear compares to the use of ice grippers, such as yak tracks? And I see a lot of people asking about yak tracks, so um, yeah. I think this will answer multiple questions. Yeah, yeah. So I just I, re I just talked about that a minute ago. So that the yak tracks, the real. So if you can, if you're going out for a hike um, in the woods or something like that, or you're um, going to be outside for a long period of time, they're good. I, you know, I gave them to my mum and she tried using them. I tried using them. The, and we, everyone that's used them um, for any period of time will tell you the same thing: that they become a hazard if you forget to take them off when you come back indoors. And so if you have someone who has trouble, if you're thinking about older adults that maybe have trouble with uh, arthritis in their hands and fingers, being able to actually take them off when you re-enter um, is a big, big risk if, if they're not able to do that. So I think it might be a solution for some people, but not everyone. Great, thank you, Slack. Um, Tracy Down also asked about yak tracks, so that has been answered. Um, and Marla had also asked about the slip-on cleats that can be put on the bottom of shoes or boots. Um, and I'm assuming she's also uh, referring to a similar concept to yak tracks. I don't know if you want to 
add anything to that slack? Yeah, I mean, there's um, there are other things that we're also testing. So there are some sprays. There are these sprays that you can get that kind of add this grit to the bottom of your shoes that we've tested, and I think it actually works fairly well. Um, so so those kinds of things are interesting. I think you know if you could spray something on the bottom of any boot you have and know that it's going to do better than what you currently have, that's the, you know, I think I don't have the name of that with me right now. But if you email me, I can dig it up and uh, and send you the the information for that product. We were thinking we should have a kind of an other section in our website to talk about some of these other things that we're looking at. Yeah. Great, thank you, Tilak. Um, Nancy Cho asked where we're going to post this uh, presentation, and all of our webinars are recorded and added to our YouTube channel. So that's the Fall Prevention Community of Practice Loop's YouTube channel. If you are a member of uh, Loop, you can also see it under our services um, tab on our website and under webinars. And you will also be sent an email after this presentation once the um, recording has been uploaded to YouTube with the link um, that you will be able to find and share and the um, uh, to like slide deck as well. Um, Denise Smith has also asked, um, how does ice compare to snow and slush for footwear? And I think you sort of have already answered that, to Talak, like, unless you want to add anything else. Yeah, there's no, uh, yeah, again, we, we need to do more, we need to come up, we need to broaden sort of our testing method and add some of these other things. Um, and it's, we don't have the, uh, we just haven't gotten there yet. We, to be honest, it's been a big challenge that the amount of time it takes for every boot that we get here, it takes us something like, I think I would say four to four to five hours because we have to test with four participants, um, and yeah, it's, it's roughly four or five hours per boot that we get here. So um, you know, it's, it, we're just trying to keep up with companies that want to do it, want to test on ice at this stage, and we have to figure out how we can broaden this in an efficient way and get more information out there. Well, thank you. Um, Kathy Thompson asks a great question. Has any testing been done on children's footwear? <laughs> no. Yeah, that's a good question. So the answer is no, unfortunately. I have a three-year-old now that I would love to get better footwear for because he's all over the place. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, I haven't yet found, I can tell you this, I haven't yet found um, any children's footwear that incorporates the, the two technologies that we're talking about today, the, the Green Diamond or the Arctic Grip, yet. But, uh, I, you know, I think if we can, if maybe I should, uh, maybe that's another good poll question for next time, is to ask whether, you know, that we can then show to some of these manufacturers or companies like Marks that there is a market for kids' footwear that's also uh, slip-resistant, not just for adults. Well, thanks, Chalak. Um, Farron Hodgson asks, have you tested Olang boots? They have the integrated traction aids in the sole of the boot. Yeah, I'm not sure if these are the same ones that I've seen. I have seen one where it's, um, it, like, are they, like, spikes? I want, the one I've seen, there are some boots that have spikes coming right out of the boot, and you can flip a little plastic thingy over, and it takes the spikes away. So I guess when you're going indoors, you can flip this thing down, and you don't have the spikes. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what the Olang ones do. They're Again, they're good as long as... I think I would be worried about the same problems as I am with Yak Tracks, which is if you go indoors, those metal spikes... Uh, I, I wouldn't want to be using metal spikes on an indoor hard flooring surface. Yeah, and uh, Talak, I'm not sure if you're taking a look at the chat box oh. in time, time, but Fairness uh, has responded, yes, they are like that. Yeah, 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 okay, okay, right. Yeah, so so that I think again would be, we haven't directly, um, I'm not sure if we've tested those ones. There is a section on our website, if you go to ratemytreads.com, you'll see there is a section on boots with spikes and I can't remember if that's actually one that we have tested, but um, yeah, you can have a look there. We have tested things like that. Great, thanks 
slide. Um, we have a question from Heather Bromley. How do we sign up for the email list? Um, I'm just taking a look on your website, on the Rate My Trip website, Slack, um, and... It's not on there. You can if so. If you have my email address, if you uh, I'm I can add you myself to that. Um, so, so I can type it into the chat box here one more time. Or this is this will be my email here. Another and option is um, if you would like to get on the email list and uh, just type in your email address in the chat box. You can address it to either Talak or um, myself, the chairperson, and uh, all of the uh, chat box items will be sent to. To Talak, and he can ensure that you are added to the mailing list. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully that makes things a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, so we have. Uh, there are still some questions uh, coming in, and we still have five minutes, so I'll just um, move along and get to get through them. Have you thought about using your materials for cane bottoms or other things like that? Yes. Yes, we have. We're we. There's a whole. It opens up a whole line of potential products. I think, as you've identified. Um, so you know wheelchair tires and scooter tires and things like that as well. You know I think um, every time I see someone out with a walker or a cane or a wheelchair and there's even the littlest bit of snow, I always feel like can't we do better? We we we, we should be able to give people better tools to meet these challenges of uh, that that happen every year, right? That I, I know a lot of people with with any of those types of products, assistive devices really dread snow and ice, and um, and uh, we have been thinking a lot about that. You know, along with that, by the way, the other thing that we've been thinking about is, and, and, uh, and maybe people here can feel free to comment on this, but making boots easier to put on is the other big area that, you know, I'm always surprised that that no one, no company, no footwear manufacturer has yet identified that as a need for older adults, people with, with potentially arthritis in their fingers, things that are, so, so we've always had this dream of making boots that, um, you know, imagine a boot that kind of holds itself open, and then when you stick your foot in, it automatically kind of closes around your ankle or something like that to make it easier. You know, the number of times we see people coming into the hospital here wearing slippers and things, or sandals, just, I think it's because it's too difficult for them to get, uh, to tie up, to do up boots or get their feet into to better boots. Um, there is a comment um, from Emily. Thanks for the presentation. I have recommended Rate My Tread to many friends and family. I would love to see a section for other, i.e. Yak Track Spray Grip, added to the website and look forward to continuing to hear about the progression of this research. Great presentation and really enjoyed listening in this morning. Um, so thank you to Emily. Uh, Beverly is asking, what are other countries doing? Um, yeah, we we have uh, there there are a number of um, a number of materials as far as we know that are similar to this uh, Arctic grip material that uh, companies are coming out with some in other countries that have different names. As far as we can tell, that's one, it's very similar technology. We haven't seen anything in other countries that we don't have available here uh, yet. Okay, great. Um, some more comments um, from Denise Smith. Consumers need to urge manufacturers to develop better boots. Um, and uh, Pajur boots, P-A-J-U-R boots, have retractable spikes but very challenging for older adults to reach soles while wearing boots, leading to hazards you mentioned for in slash outdoors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, so those are like the ones that I was sort of imagining uh, where you flip a little piece of plastic that has spikes on it, I think. Um, but yeah, I agree that it's not really, for an older adult, to, I can't really imagine someone you know, with a balance problem or something like that trying to stand there bracing themselves and lifting up a foot so they can flip one of these things over. It's not really practical for that use. Yes, definitely. Um, and I think this is the last question before we close things off, but um, Anne is asking uh, if curling grippers have been tested. Yeah, we, we haven't. Um, and I thought about it, though, because I do think they're made of a soft, soft rubber. Uh, so that it's a good point that we could 
you know, for people who um, maybe don't, aren't looking for a boot, there are some people who would benefit from more of a shoe that they would know would work well. Um, that 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 could be an alternative solution. So we probably should check how well those those work. Yeah, good good suggestion. Wonderful, thank you, Talak. Um, so again, we're uh, we're just one minute out for this uh, webinar, so uh, we'll close things off. Um, I would like to thank our presenter, Talak, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it was very engaging, and we had a lot of really great questions. It looks like. Uh, there are a lot of people who would like to be added to your uh, mailing list to hear more about your research. So um, I think that's, uh, that just shows that people are very engaged. And uh, it's, such a, it's such a very practical uh, topic. We have the Rate My Treads site on our Fall Prevention Month uh, uh, website as a resource for um, not only healthcare practitioners, but for older adults as well. Um, and I think everyone was able to, to take something away from that presentation. Uh, as well, I'd like to thank all of our participants today for joining us and engaging in such a great discussion. Um, for more information about the Fall Prevention Community of Practice, please visit loop at fallsleep.com. Um, and um, I would just like to insert a little bit of uh, information about uh, Fall Prevention Month. As most of you might know, November is Fall Prevention Month, and we have a website that's listed there on your screen for you. Um, and for Fall Prevention Month, we do have a couple of more webinars uh, lined up this month. Um, so if you are interested in any of these, I will be sending out the links for both of these upcoming webinars um, that you can register for. Um, so this is our uh, Loop website. Um, if you haven't already registered, uh, please feel free to take a look. Um, and uh, see if you'd like to join the community of practice. Uh, new this year, we've actually launched an online community of practice for uh, children's falls. Um, it's called Loop Junior. So if you have a passionate interest in children's falls or falls across the lifespan, uh, please join us at www.jr.fallsloop.com. Please don't close the window just yet. Uh, wait until you've been redirected to the next screen where a brief evaluation survey will launch in your browser. We always appreciate if you can provide uh, some feedback so we can continue to offer high quality webinars. Thanks everyone, have a wonderful day and uh, happy Fall Prevention Month. Thank you again to luck. Thanks everybody.